Hello everyone, it's Dmitry Anoshin and Surfalytics. Um, today we have our next lesson, uh, Model 2, about databases. Uh, and today we'll talk about uh, DuckDB database. Um, it has community edition, open source DuckDB. It has a commercial one, Mother Duck. But first of all, we will try to understand together what is DuckDB and what are the use cases. And we'll do some tutorials together. Um, let's get started. And by the way, don't forget to subscribe and like. And if you want to practice more, if you looking to become professional data analyst, data engineer, or analytics engineer, or BI developer, you probably should consider to join Surfalytics community where we every week doing different projects. Uh, we're building end-to-end -end projects, uh, different members running different projects. For example, just today we finished a Google BigQuery project and we'll continue to do uh, before we worked on AWS, Lambda, Step Functions, Redshift. So we constantly learning new technology. We apply them. We practice in how to go over the interviews. We have the mock interviews. We practice in SQL, in Python, lead code, and so on and so on. So definitely a very powerful community that can give you competitive advantage and help you to become better and faster achieve your goals. So now we can go back to our topic about DuckDB. So what we need to do? Uh, first of all, I have the repo, uh, GitHub Surfalytics, with repo for analytics scores. And here I'm uploading the uh, labs that we're going to use. So here we have the lesson seven for the model two about DuckDB. So there's some information and how you can install the, the very first step you need to install. It depends on the operation system. You can go with uh, brew install DuckDB if it's Mac OS, or if you use the Windows, then you need to first install WinGet and then actually doing this. On the model zero of Surfalytic course, I already covered how to prepare your local environment. Depends on if it's Mac OS or Windows, what, how you can, uh, can configure the CLI tool, for example, for Windows. It's uh, really nice to have the um, uh, Ubuntu. Uh, CLI versus PowerShell, but there are different options. So, and from my experience, I noticed lots of data jobs in actually people using the Mac OS. So Mac, Mac OS is definitely easier. So it's totally up to you and you can decide whatever you like more. In my case, I'm going to use uh, Mac OS. So, uh, and the very first step for us would be to install DuckDB and I already installed mine. So I will skip this step. Uh, this is the website about DuckDB. Uh, they, looks like they soon we'll have the conference. Um, and um, it's simple, portable, fast, extensible, and free. So I agree with everything. Um, I know it worked in the past. We just recently learned with uh, Surfalytics community and we tried different use cases and everyone very exciting about this product. So now you're going to learn DuckDB as well. And don't forget, as soon as you finish this uh, hands-on, you can open your resume and you can add DuckDB into your resume. Uh, and also you can answer another interview questions. You can talk about, for example, the question, what did you learn recently? And you can, oh, you know, I just finished uh, DuckDB tutorials. I learned DuckDB. I switched from Pandas uh, to DuckDB. It's really convenient and blah, blah, blah. So it's, um, it's a really nice answer because many people during interview like to ask uh, how, how you get like inspiration, what tools and technology you learn. So in Surfalytics, one of them, because we constantly look to the market, we see what's the popular right now, and we're learning lots of different things. So the, the next projects will be related, for example, to Polaris and PyArror, where are lots of projects going on about Databricks, about Azure, AWS, and GCP. So we're constantly learning and see how we can apply those real world scenarios um, in our um, not we, we, sorry, how we can apply real world scenarios uh, at work, especially people who are already working. They can see how the others experience data engineers and data analysts, what they're using, how they work, and they can learn from them and then apply to work. Okay, I'm going to VS Code. So, and here uh, I have my, so I will. 
clean my, my CLI and I use uh, Z shell. Again, in model zero, I covered how to configure VS code, how to configure CLI, how to configure GitHub. Another thing you, you, sh you should always, whatever you do, any tutorials, any projects you do, you should save your work in GitHub and follow the traditional life cycle. So then you create the branch, you have the pull request and then the merge. And this is really nice practice to have. Doesn't matter what role you have. If you work with data, you should know CLI, you should know ID, you should know GitHub. And of course you need to know the Docker. So what we have here. So first of all, we can see what folder I'm now. So right now I'm in DuckDB folder, exactly where I want to be. And um, we can, what we can do, so I can hide this for now. I can make half of screen like this and another half like this. So, and now I can copy the command. So very first step, we can launch a DuckDB and it's open DuckDB. It tells me the version I'm on. Um, we can open persistent database, but right now we don't have anything. So we can create the table. Um, yeah. Uh, as you notice, we have D and D is a kind of like a cursor. We don't need this. So, okay. We create uh, the table and the next command from fonts, if I repeat this one more time, it's a kind of like select statement. So the same that you can do select, if I will do select star from fonts, it's the same. But DuckDB has this uh, cool feature. You, you can skip select star and just run right from, and it will return everything. So this is my table. Uh, there is the version, there is the model columns and one row I have. Uh, the challenge with this, uh, yeah, we create the table, but this table live in, in my session. If I will quit, uh, for example, if I quick, I quit from DuckDB, I open again. And if I will try again, run the operation, uh, it tells me, sorry, we don't have this table. It's that's why we need to use a uh, persistent storage. And the persistent storage could be in DB format, DuckDB or DDB. So really, if you ever work with SQLite, so the idea is the same. So you have the, your file as a database and the, then you can query it. So it's, I will skip this step because I am already in DuckDB. So, and I want to run this command. So this command, what it gonna do uh, inside my folder data, it will create uh, my DB database. And um, if I will run this command, oh, I, I should first need to quit and then I run it. And if I will check the, my databases, I can see this database among databases. Now I can quit and my data will base will still live as a file. So if I open here and go in data, so now here I have my database DB. Right now it's empty, but now we can start to actually create the tables inside and work as, in the same way as the traditional database. So now we want to create the table inside database, and then we can query it. So all the same. Uh, there is alternative options. For example, if someone give you the database file and you want just to read it without any access to modification, then you can simply do DuckDB read only uh, flag and path to your database. And then it's open the same database only in read mode. So it's convenient for you to share with someone like to avoid of modifications. And if we running database, for example, I already in active session with DuckDB, we can always run this command to attach existing database as a persistent storage. So now we will learn some of cool features of DuckDB. The very first one, we can select from the external files. Again, let's look what files we have. Inside the data folder, we already have the um, one CSV file. This is sales orders, uh, superstore data that we use in model two for the Postgres. 
and we're using model one for spreadsheet analytics and we're basically using it over and over this edition originally coming from tableau uh, there is one simple json file and that's it so let's let's try it what um, i use a shortcut command key and it's clean the output so the shortcut is really nice things to know because it saves you lots of time. So let's try to query my CC file. And we see it's returning nice and easy. So, but it, it tells me it's almost uh, 8,400 rows and only 40 showing. And it has 23 columns, but it's, it's smart about um, uh, that I have this size of uh, terminal open and it shows only six columns. Because if you ever work with Spark and with Spark you run output command, it, it will truncate everything and like just not nice. Okay, very good to see what we have in the file. So, and assuming you want to move uh, this file from CSV to persistent storage of DuckDB. And then we ca can create the table um, here. I, we just need to rename it, uh, not Netflix, but sales orders. And next command, what I can do if I, this is my table, I can just run from and it will return the same. But right now data, we're not reading from CSV, we're reading from my persistent storage. Another cool thing that I really like uh, that we can convert CSV file to parquet. And this is example of command. And we can see, do we have now parquet? And you see the parquet was created. And I recently learned that uh, in the past, for example, if you want to analyze parquet, because the parquet is kind is a default standard for data lakes or lake house with delta and iceberg, usually everyone go with parquet. Uh, and we already covered in model one, uh, we covered different data types and we covered what parquet is. But here is the real world challenge. So we work as an analyst or data engineer or analytics engineer, and you need to download the parquet files from data lake that was created by ETL process and exploring. Uh, if you try to open it with VS code, it's not working. Uh, and in the past, we have to install different CLI tools like parquet tools that we can query the parquet. Now in marketplace, we have new nice uh, plugin. Parquet viewer. So we can see this is probably the most popular. Uh, we installing it and we'll try to read it. So we can see how it works. So it should out of the box. Let's try it. And you see, it works very nice, right? But there is also alternative, we can use the DuckDB. And another benefit of DuckDB that we can, uh, we don't need even download the parquet locally. We can query parquet that available externally. That's a very nice feature of, of par parquet. Okay. I mean, very nice feature of DuckDB. Let's move on. Uh, yeah, that's example how we can query from Parquet if we have. And that's nice because if you have Parquet, pretty decent size, like you know, even gigabytes, DuckDB is very efficient and performant. You can write the SQL query uh, against your Parquet files and do some local analytics. Okay, let's move on. And the same way we can convert different um, from one format to another, but also we can work with uh, Iceberg and Delta Lake formats that also very popular nowadays. So let's move to the next feature, uh, display modes. So I have the file here. Um, I actually rename it. Uh, it's now names file. So let's try to query it. So 
So we have the JSON. But we can change the mode. So basically, it's the output. And we can try the mode and do the same. And you see, for JSON, now we're reading as a JSON. So it's basically parsing um, everything for us. Uh, there is another one, what I really like, is the mode markdown. So for example, we we want, and when, when do you need markdown? Again, it's very popular if you do the pull request and code review in Git, then you will use the markdown. Or if you publish anything in your GitHub repo, it's the good rule to always add readme.md file, it means markdown. And every model of Surfalytic, every lesson Surfalytic, I constantly remind you, yeah, use version control, use GitHub, it's very helpful. And here, the mode markdown. And now, if we're going to ru run, and we also can say that we want to save output. And now, if we're going to run any query, for example, I will use my small query with the fonts. And you see the outputs are not showing here. The, instead, the outputs went to markdown file, and it's here. So, and we can copy paste this and insert into documentations, readme, or in pull requests. So it's very convenient. Even if you want to share some results with um, your colleagues in Slack, you can or other messenger, you can use the code. You know, remember, like then we use this, like and this, like uh, triple quotes. And here we can insert the code snippet or markdown snippet. It's really nice. And if you're doing so, it shows that you are actually quite experienced engineer or analyst. So that do not hesitate to use these little tricks that will show your colleagues that you actually know what you're doing and you're quite experienced. Yeah, that's okay. We can move forward. We did markdown. So another thing. We even can run uh, the queries. So to quit from DuckDB, I use uh, Ctrl C twice. Maybe there is the command like exit or quit something. They didn't work for me. Maybe there is this special command to to quit. I just didn't look into this. So we can execute um, from terminal, right? And uh, we see the output. So really quickly, you don't need to launch the DuckDB. Uh, the DuckDB has lots of settings. And uh, we can check the our configuration. Uh, first, I need to open DuckDB, and then I can check the configuration. It's uh, lots of them. It's not even showing everything. So, and if we go into the documentation, uh, there is the configurations, and we can change lots of different things. So, but th this is uh, valuable if you're gonna use it more frequently for your work, then you can go here and see what actually you can do. Uh, another nice thing about DuckDB, it has lots of different extensions. We can see, do I have any extensions um, available? And you see, this is the list of extensions that are already available for me. And we can, for example, install more extensions. For example, HTTPFs. These extensions help to work with HTTP resources. So first we install it, and then we, we can load it. And this is uh, how quickly we can do. But looks like it's already installed for me, because then I prepare on materials, I did install it. There is also could be extensions that built by community members, and then we might use unsigned. That is not official. For example, recently I saw a really nice extension someone built for Google Sheets. So basically, you can query the same as a query from a local CSU file. Uh, we can query from Google Sheets. And for this, we need to use the special plugin. Uh, the next thing what we want to do, um, from DuckDB, um, I saw they, they have little projects where we can analyze um, Netflix data, what people watch on COVID. So first of all, let's try and do it together. We install this plugin, it's already installed. Uh, we, we set the S3 region. region. So if you know AWS has different regions, 
uh, US East one of them. It's where the data center located. And uh, then we're going to create the table Netflix by reading external S3 bucket. So this is the link for the free bucket. It has the public access. Otherwise, we're not able to open it. Um, and to so if I say, I don't know, it should should be, yeah, I I don't remember, but basically we can use HTTPS uh, format to going through for this and uh, and download this file ourselves. But anyway, uh, okay. Why I didn't? What? It, yeah, it didn't like because I have D here. So we create a table, and now we can select it. We have seven thousand one hundred rows and ten columns. And the next step, we're gonna do aggregation. So this is the aggregation. And uh, we can also save result in CSV or Markdown. So we should check, do we have the CSV? Oh, I run twice the same. Yeah, we have the CSV. We can save the same in Markdown. Okay. And then I want to talk about API use case. For example, in traditional use case, what you might to do, you might uh, want to query API and download the data. And usually the very simple way straightforward is to use the Python and library request. And also you need library JSON because you, usually response from API, it's the JSON format. So, and this is example of um, API from GitHub endpoint. This is my URL. Using uh, request library, I will get, I will call and get result. And if re response 200 means successful, uh, I want to assign my response in JSON format to data. And then I want to save it as a file. Uh, otherwise, I want to give the error. So this is very standard behavior. So what I can do now with help of DuckDB, assuming I have this file with response of JSON, I can read uh, the JSON uh, and I can start to query. So it means I have the local file and I can work and process this file, do some transformations and exploration. So this is one way. Uh, which alternative way? We can use DuckDB Python library. And we, we do all the same, we query API, we get result, but then we get uh, create the connection to DuckDB, and then we create uh, the table based on the response of uh, JSON. So it means we don't need to save the JSON locally, JSON in memory, and we basically run the command that will pass this JSON output into DuckDB, it will read and save, and then we can, we can query the table. So this is another example. And finally, I want to highlight a couple of use cases for you. For I don't need this anymore. Um, for the homework assignment, if you decide to do this, uh, in model one, we have these uh, spreadsheets, right? And we work with um, spreadsheets uh, and use Superstore datasets to answer some questions. And we do similar here. Uh, then we write the SQL query. So what you can do, you can use the same data sets, but now write the same SQL queries against the DuckDB. This is one. And the second, because we already have the lesson uh, 2.5, then we talk about visualization for database. So you can choose any database you like, and then you can connect it to DuckDB and trying to build the dashboard on top of DuckDB. It could be Power BI, it could be Tableau Desktop, it could be Looker, Sigma BI, if it, I don't know, maybe Sigma BI doesn't support uh, DuckDB, but you can basically play a bit with visualization and build dashboard on top of DuckDB. So let's look to some of the use cases. Some use cases, um, what I can see. So analytics on the structured data. So 
I know that many analysts they they really comfortable work with pandas. Uh, they can they have the CC file. They can create data frame. They can start exploration, writing the Python using notebook. So it's basically an alternative way to explore the file. But in this case, you're going to use uh, SQL SQL queries for this, uh, and it's very fast and efficient. And one of the key advantage of DuckDB that very often then you work with um, local even BI tools or pandas, you're restricted by memory you have. So for example, if you have eight gigabyte of operation memory and already half of it consumed by, basically if it's consumed by your operation system, then, then it means you, you have limitation. Uh, you have the limitation with your memory and uh, you couldn't work with a huge file. You need somehow like break it. DuckDB can work with larger file than you have operation memory. So it hook analysis, the Python integrations, aggregation joins, and works really fast and efficient. So ETL processing, uh, it works fine with traditional formats, CSV, parquet, join, JSON. And you already saw that if you have the options with API, if you can query API, get output, of course you can go with Python, but you can go with DuckDB and you can use uh, DuckDB as a processing of your data. Of course, if the size of the data will allow you. So you can think about something as a Spark can do, but on the single single machine. So efficient product processing of data, uh, lower overhead pipeline development, really nice for local development and testing. So, um, specific technical advantage. It, it like, By the way, DuckDB is columnar storage. It has all up workloads. It has vectorized query execution, efficient compression, and parallel query execution. So those are some benefits. So what I want to quickly highlight uh, about all up workloads. And um, if we open um, DuckDB, it will tell us, you know, it's um, all up. And special for this reason, I open, first of all, just to cover what does mean all up. One more time, I probably covered it in the model one, OLAP versus OLTP. In straightforward and nutshell, OLTP, it means your backend transactional database. So it's optimized for fast transactions. It's either insert, delete, updates, like you can think e-commerce store, right? The, the customer buys something um, and transaction immediately go into database, very fast and efficient. And there could be hundred thousands of transactions. But if you decide to query two years of my sales data, it is not a good idea to using OLTP database because it's not suitable for this kind of workloads. On the other hand, uh, your analytical database, even if this is the Postgres and this is the Postgres like here, uh, where is the, the database here? Um, they even don't uh, specify anything here. They have S3 and anything. So assuming here we will have database like Postgres and RDS Postgres, this Two, diff two same database, but they serve the different purpose. And if they serve the purpose for analytics queries, this is all up. But for, I don't like honestly use all up because, okay, in nutshell, it's uh, transactional versus analytical queries. That's it. That's it what you need to know. And there is like some pros and cons. But if you go deeper in history, and I, I, I might cover this in the model one, then I talk like 30 years of history. Um, in the past, we had the traditional like database. Could be SQL Server, MySQL, even Oracle, your traditional SMP database. Uh, and then you have some kind of front end or BI tool. And there were two options if we talk about business intelligence. For example, business objects, uh, Cognos, uh, Oracle BI. MicroStrategy, they all works in rollup way. What does it mean? It's relational rollup. So it means then BI tools, then you drag and drop your dimensions and measures uh, ready to click run to build your visualizations or dashboard or report in your BI tool. Uh, under hood, uh, this BI tool will generate the query. The query will be submitting to database and then returning back. So this rollup server is a kind of like could be just BI server. It's take the, the output of database and then keep it as a cache and then you can slice and dice it. Uh, in, in, and the thing is the data is still storing as a like tabular format. On the other hand, uh, there exists multi, 
multidimensional online analytical processing. And this was slightly different because here uh, we, we do the same, but we have one extra step. For example, we might use analysis services, Microsoft Analysis Services, to create the data model, our semantic layer, uh, where we can choose the tables we want, the relationship, and especially hierarchy between the dimensions, like for example, year, month, date, hour, or like product category, uh, product subcategory and category, and so on and so on. So that we, we can build this semantic layer and then we can compute the cube. So then we compute the cube, we, we cache the data in the same way. It's the same what, for example, Tableau Extract is doing, but I mean, it's very different technology, but still uh, we have our extract of data. And this was a multidimensional cube and Unfortunately, for analysts, if you want to query this cube, you need to know not the SQL, but MDX. This is multidimensional query language. Uh, this is one downside, but also if you want to connect your traditional BI tool like that I mentioned, or even Tableau Power BI to this uh, multidimensional cube, they have lots of limitations, but there was one big advantage and it's still many companies using this kind of technology because if you're going to connect the cross uh, cross uh, your Excel spreadsheet, your pivot, you will build the cross tables. This is, will be really natural, all your hierarchies and you like slice and dice your data in very convenient way. And also, as you know, Excel spreadsheets, the Microsoft Excel is free in terms of BI, right? And if you have thousands of users, you can build one cube a day, for example, sales, sales data, and then thousands of users can connect it and slice and dice the data win-win. The business users knows how to use Excel uh, and they, everyone is happy about the output. So it's just like two different um, uh, couple things that good to know uh, for better understanding. Yeah, that's it for me. And don't forget to like and subscribe and we're going to learn more database. Probably I'm planning also cover the ClickHouse in the next lesson. Uh, and with this, uh, after ClickHouse, you probably will finish Model 2, and then you can go to the Model 3. Thank you, everyone.